What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Just One Man Revelation series. And it is time for us to begin our study of Christ's kingdom on earth. So we're still in chapter 20, but that follows the 75 days after his return to earth that we looked at last week. So all preparations, they've been set for the kingdom to start. The earth has been restored. Uh, the temple has been cleansed and rebuilt in a new and better way. Evil of the world has been set aside, at least for a time, and the citizens of the kingdom are present, ready to receive their inheritance in that time. All resurrected saints from Old Testament, uh, church, tribulation, are entering the kingdom, as well as those believers who didn't die in tribulation. All living unbelievers, which were only Gentile at this point, they are sent to Hades. And so now we get to learn about this millennial kingdom. And if we just look in the book of Revelation to study that time, uh, we're going to be really disappointed because it's not there. Uh, look with me here, uh, chapter 20, verses 6 and 7. It says, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection, over these the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. When a thousand years are complete, Satan will be released from his prison. And that's it. So verse 6, we learn what happens before the kingdom begins. And in verse 7, we learn what happens after the kingdom ends. So the book of Revelation really tells us nothing about what happens during the thousand years in the kingdom. The entire kingdom period takes place between verses 6 and 7. The only thing the book of Revelation tells us about the kingdom is the length of time, the thousand years. And the reason Revelation virtually ignores the details of the kingdom is because the rest of the Bible is literally filled with all of those details. The kingdom is described in the Torah. Um, it's a major theme of the Old Testament prophets and the Psalms. Jesus offers tantalizing details in many of his parables and other teachers. Uh, even the epistle writers give us a few details. So we got to venture outside the book of Revelation. And we'll do this for the next two episodes to examine the life and times of the kingdom. And so we're going to begin uh, just by remembering what the term kingdom means in the Bible. You know, many Christians operate with a very limited or superficial understanding of their own eternal future. The concept of the kingdom or heaven is largely limited to, you know, some hallmark theology, if you will. And as a result, our understanding is largely void of substance or even meaning. Ironically, the Bible speaks extensively about the coming kingdom using a variety of terms and descriptions, uh, pictures or shadows. In fact, the coming kingdom is one of the most important themes of the Old Testament, second only to the Messiah himself. And we can find these references literally from Genesis all the way to Malachi. And in the New Testament, discussions of the kingdom were tremendously important to Jesus' ministry. There are 160 mentions of the kingdom in the New Testament. 125 of those are in the Gospels. Jesus talked of entering the kingdom, living in the kingdom, ruling in the kingdom, having an inheritance in the kingdom. Paul also taught, taught that we would receive our inheritance in the kingdom when Christ returns. And then now Revelations told us how long it is, thousand years. So if we look at the Bible's teaching about the kingdom across all these references, we find the concept of the kingdom progressing. Kingdom concepts transitions through four stages of meaning from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament. And so it's important to recognize these transition points to arrive at a proper interpretation. The kingdom theme begins in Genesis as a promise, something God would do to correct the sin of Adam. That promise is clearly articulated in the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants. The nation of Israel would enjoy an inheritance of land, uh, posterity, um, of descendants, and a perfect king, an unending peace. And many generations of believers in Israel looked forward to the future fulfillment of that promise. Then the time came to fulfill the promise. The Lord came to Israel offering the kingdom in that day. Jesus made Israel proposal. Set me as your king, I'll give you the promised kingdom. But they rejected their king, as um, you can 
see that throughout the gospel, especially in Matthew. And as a result, Jesus withdrew his proposal and the kingdom was taken from that generation of Israel. And in their place, the kingdom proposal was given to Gentiles, who became the bride of Christ instead of Israel. So the proposal of the kingdom was temporarily withdrawn, and in its place emerged a program of recruiting Gentiles to join the kingdom. This program advances the call to believe in Jesus, and as a person obeys the call, they become a part of a spiritual kingdom. They become citizens of a heavenly kingdom that is not of this world. And this program will continue until the Lord puts an end to it by calling his bride to heaven at the resurrection. Then, as we've already studied, the Lord will return to earth a second time. At that point, the kingdom will appear as promised. And at that point, the kingdom will become a literal place, just as God promised to Abraham and his descendants. It will exist on earth in the future and will also include men and women from all the nations. This is also a fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham when God said all nations would be blessed through him. So the concept of a kingdom progresses from a promise to a proposal to a program and finally to a place. And that and at that that's the point we've reached in Revelation. We've seen the program come to an end at the rapture. Now we have the kingdom begin at Christ's second coming. And in this time to come, all the good things the Lord has promised to his people will finally be fulfilled. So let's learn about that place, a very real world that we will inhabit for a thousand years. We will enjoy that time in a home we call ours with land and possessions that can never be taken away. We'll be absent of disease and sorrow, for there will be nothing about us or the world to disturb our peace or joy. We'll have meaningful work that's not hard. We'll have relationships, uh, natural beauty to enjoy, and we will know, worship, and serve the Lord in ways that we can't even imagine today. We can't say exactly what the earth and seas look like after the restoration, but one thing's for sure. The world of the kingdom won't be less of a place to enjoy than the world we have now. The beauty and suitability of the kingdom of the kingdom earth won't be less than the beauty and enjoyment in the world today. On the contrary, it will be far greater. And while there's much that we can't know about that place, there's still a lot that we do know. The goal here is to learn what we can in a short time so that our understanding of that time would grow. And as we come to understand more about what life in that place will be like, we can look forward to it even more. And as you think more about the kingdom life, you begin to live more for that life rather than for this life. And because there's a lot we could say about the kingdom, we need to approach this um, in sections. First, we'll study the changes in the order of creation and in nature, including geography, borders, and government of the land. Secondly, we'll study the people in the kingdom and the quality of daily life in that time. Thirdly, we'll study Jesus' place in the kingdom, including the nature of worship at the new kingdom temple. And then finally, we'll study the culminating event of the kingdom, the war of Gog and Magog. So let's start the way creation changes during the kingdom period. And that study begins by looking at the past. You know, when Adam and woman sinned, the Lord... He responded to their sin with a series of pronouncements. So let's look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 17, 18, and 19. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and you have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, but thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So the Lord responds to Adam's willful sin by cursing the ground, or the earth itself. God placed the earth under a curse, and a curse from God is a pronouncement of judgment resulting in destruction. So the earth will one day be destroyed and replaced, as we'll soon see. In the meantime, the nature of creation also changed, starting with the need for mankind to toil to produce food from the ground. The Lord declares that the earth would produce thorns and thistles naturally, so apart from the toil of man, the earth would produce weeds and unhelpful plants, 
Only by the sweat of his brow would man be able to produce the food that he required. Before that, man enjoyed life in the garden, produced all the food he required without any work at all. No weeds, no unhelpful plants, crowding out the good ones. Adam needed to just walk outside, and he found all the food that he wanted. Furthermore, the days of man will be numbered, meaning life would have an end called death. The spirit of Adam died in the moment that he ate of the fruit, and now his physical body would also die. Everything that came from the ground was cursed like the ground itself, which meant the physical body of man was to die. Likewise, the animal kingdom, which was also made from the earth, would also die. So the Lord instituted a process of decay that resulted in physical bodies succumbing to diseases and frailty over time. Death may also come from inst instances um, of acts of violence, which are themselves a result of sin. All of this was a change from the beginning because the physical body was created to live forever. Without sin, Paul explains in Romans, there would be no death either for us or for any creature. So after the fall, the order of creation changed in fundamental ways to include difficulty working the land and the death of the body. Then after following the flood, the Lord made more changes to creation, specifically to the animal kingdom. Jump over to Revelation 9, uh, verses 1 through 3. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to him, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky, with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea, and to your hands they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. So the Lord gave mankind permission to eat animal flesh after the flood. Prior to that, human beings ate only plants as God directed in the garden. Though the text doesn't mention the animal's diet changing, we assume that animals begin to eat each other too after this time. This change would have been necessary since in the days and weeks after the flood, vegetation would have been sparse. So without meat, animals would have starved. Likewise, a change in the earth's climate following the flood made it more difficult to grow crops. Then to protect the animals from just a quick extinction, Lord leveled the playing field by placing a fear of man into animals. Animals were previously unafraid of men and of each other, but now this predator-prey relationship is established. So the world we know, where people and animals eat one another, attack one another, ultimately die, represents a change to creation's original intent. Likewise, the difficulty with which we work with nature is also a change in God's original plan. These things were brought about as a result of man's sin, and in the future, the Lord has a plan to correct um, for all of these consequences of Adam's sins, and he does it in stages. During the kingdom, he brings the correction process, and he completes it in the new heavens and new earth that will follow this thousand-year millennial kingdom. Isaiah says, And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf with the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So one of the first comforting things we learn about the created order of the kingdom is that animals exist there as well. Um, you know, a lot of people say, well, is my pet going to go to heaven with me? Well, animals don't have a soul, so they're not going to be in heaven. But when we look at this millennial kingdom, you know, we get an answer that there will be, there will be animals there. So according to Isaiah 11, the nature of the animal kingdom is changed. Predators like wolves, leopards, lions live peacefully next to prey like lambs, goats, and calves. Even more interesting, large dangerous animals will pose no threat to people, and animals will show no fear of them. Even a cobra possesses no risk to a small child, and a young boy uh, can command the obedience of any animal. And being without the reason to fear men, these animals will cease attacking men with lethal defensive mechanisms. In short, all animals can be domesticated now and will obey the will of man, and we will once again have dominion over the animal kingdom. Next, the Lord reverses the curse of toiling to produce food in the kingdom life. In speaking about what Israel will experience in the kingdom, the Lord says life gets easy. 
the Lord establishes a covenant of peace with Israel, and that covenant establishes the nation in their land once more. And in that place, the Lord makes the hills of Israel a blessing again. He says they can sleep in the woods securely without fear, which is a way of indicating they have no enemies, neither man nor beast. Um, he says all of this in Ezekiel 34, verses 25 through 7, 37. Um, and, and in there, he, you'll notice that the tree of the field will yield fruit and the earth will yield increase. These are terms referring to the natural production of the earth without the need to farm or cultivate the land. This is a direct reversal of the curse of the earth that made life hard and difficult. Now that curse has been lifted so that working in the field isn't work anymore. This is, the, this is true for both Israel and all nations on the earth. So when you hear that we are given an inheritance of the land and our life will be one of farming, you need to understand what that means. It's not a hard life. It's the opposite. Farming is a joy when the land is giving you its produce without the need to prepare the land or even sow the seed. Um, still in Ezekiel chapter 36, the Lord says the land will be like Eden again and there will never again be a famine in the land. The Lord will call for fruit and grain to come forth for the people. So how hard would it be to farm a land producing food at the call of God's voice? It's also a great picture of grace. The Lord does the work. We receive the blessing. So how does God ensure so much success farming in a desert? Well, in Isaiah 30, verses 23 through 26, after the Lord rescues Israel, he gives it the good things he promised in the kingdom. Where before they suffered um, deprivation during the time of tribulation, now they have all they need. Um, they get rain and rich, roomy pastures for cattle with plenty of feed. And then we hear that the ge geography of Israel is different than today. Streams running everywhere on tops of mountains, rains falling wherever they plant. Even more curious, the moon and sun see their brightness increased dramatically. So it's not clear whether Isaiah means this literally or whether it is simply a literally um, device indicating the optimistic, joyful perspective of Israel. That is, in this day, the sun will seem brighter, but if it's literal, it brings more questions than it does answer. How could we survive on a planet with so much light? I mean, obviously we can trust God has a way to accommodate these changes and still produce a wonderful world. Um, but I guess worst case scenario, we all got a really good tan, right? So the creation in the kingdom will be closer to the time of Eden with animals obeying man, no predators killing one another, and the land producing easily. But one thing will not change. The curse of Satan and the serpent will continue throughout the kingdom, period. If we look back in Genesis 3, the Lord also placed a curse on Satan for his part in the fall. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. So the serpent was a literal snake indwelled by Satan who took the snake as a disguise to deceive woman. As a result of that moment, the Lord cursed the snake. The snake was made to give up its legs and crawl on the ground. This tells us that prior to the fall, that snakes stood upright, or at least its belly didn't touch the ground. Um, if you're a dragon fan out there, maybe it had wings. And so a snake with wings would be... A dragon. But from this point forward, the snake would be against the ground to remind men of their eventual destination, the earth. Now, obviously, the snake was an unwitting participant in that moment, and not to be blamed for the outcome, so the Lord's curse against the snake isn't intended as a punishment against the animal. Instead, it's a memorial to remind mankind of that moment and of their true adversary. So, for as long as Satan remains, and for as long as sin is still a part of life on earth, the snake would assume this form. So, does this curse get reversed in the kingdom period? No. In the kingdom, Isaiah says the snake continues to eat dust, which is a direct reference back to Genesis 3. In other words, the snake's cursed form 
continues unchanged during the kingdom. His form isn't changing because the conditions that led to his new form haven't been reversed either. Satan's still around, though he's bound until the end of the kingdom. So now let's consider other changes to the borders and geography that take place during the renewing of the heavens and the earth. First, Israel will exist in the kingdom, but Israel's borders will be different than they are today or any time in the past. God establishes new borders for Israel while eliminating the historical enemies of Israel that surrounded her. Today, Israel occupies a relatively small slice of land against the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Lebanon is to the north, Egypt to the south, Jordan, Syria to the east. And this territory is only a fraction of what the nation once possessed at the height of the kingdom under Solomon. At that time, Israel was the dominant kingdom on earth the superpower of its day. At its zenith, Israel reached well north into Syria, including all of Lebanon and the land east of the Jordan, and it stretched southward towards Egypt and southern Jordan. Israel has never since controlled so much territory. Now, we might expect that God would give Israel a grant of land similar to the land they held under David and Solomon, but that's not the half of it. Literally, let's look back to the land promised to Abraham and his descendants in the covenant. Genesis fifteen eighteen. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. God gives Israel borders from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. Now, the river of Egypt is at the historical border of Israel in Egypt in the Sinai Peninsula. And the Euphrates River is in Iraq, which is far east of any historical borders of Israel. Later, when Israel moved into the Promised Land under Joshua, the Lord reiterated the borders of the land he was giving to Israel. And in Joshua chapter 1, the Lord elaborates on his grant of land, saying he gave Israel the land from the wilderness to Lebanon. And from the great river Euphrates to the great sea. These descriptions extend far beyond the traditional borders of Israel. These are the borders God has promised that will be Israel in the day he fulfills his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to Israel. Uh, Ezekiel gives us some more markers in Ezekiel uh, 47, 15 through 20. And if you plot those... You'll see Israel will occupy a far larger area of land than anything seen before. More importantly, God's promises for Israel to rule over their captors is fulfilled by these borders. Israel will consume all the nations that historically persecuted her in this region. Um, Moab, Ammon, Edom, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, all the others, just as God promised in Isaiah. So we have Israel much larger than it's ever been, um, and will consume its neighbors. Now, we don't have any borders for the Gentile nations, except that the Bible does note that many familiar nations will be represented. Um, and time doesn't really permit to explore a lot of those details. Um, you can check out the book of Ezekiel if you want some of those. But in summary, many nations will be repopulated around, around the earth with Gentile believers though there are a few exceptions. Edom will exist in the kingdom, but will remain empty as a memorial to their sin against Israel. It will be the location of the entry to the pit where Satan is held. Smoke will pour out from the pit. No human being will set foot in this land. Secondly, Egypt will exist, but the Egyptians of the kingdom will not be allowed to enter their land for the first 40 years of the kingdom. This is a memorial to the way Egypt... Um, stumbled Israel with idols, leading to Israel's time wandering in the desert. But eventually Egypt will be allowed to um, be inhabited after that 40 years are up. Those are the major geographical and boundary changes of the kingdom, but there are also natural changes to the land in the kingdom. In addition to the land being more fruitful with more rivers, there will be other major geographical changes, starting with the mountain on which Jerusalem sits. Malachi 4.1, or Micah 4.1 says, And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the people will stream to it. So this mountain will be raised up high. It will draw people towards it from around the world. 
The mountain at the center of Israel will become the tallest mountain in the world, and on top of the mountain will sit the temple, the house of the Lord, where Christ dwells. And we'll study more about the temple in future episodes. Next, Zechariah says there will be new rivers flowing from the top of the mountain. The city of Jerusalem will become the source for two rivers, one that flows east the other west. The river that flows west will end up in the Mediterranean Sea, while the one that flows east will end up in the Dead Sea. And according to Ezekiel, this new river flowing east will have a dramatic impact over the Dead Sea. The river flowing from Mount Zion will transform the Dead Sea into a fresh water body of water. Now, Ezekiel doesn't say if this happens miraculously, like if it's instant, or naturally over time as the fresh water continues to um, dilute the sea. With the sense of the text saying that this is a miraculous change, especially considering that the lake becomes filled with every kind of fish. So the Dead Sea comes to life as a beautiful millennial picture of God's grace bringing life to the dead. Ezekiel adds that fishermen will fish there um, from in Engedi, saying that wrong, but that's fine, which is in the south near um, Masada, which is unknown, but probably somewhere in the north. They will fish according to their kinds, meaning there will be so much variety of fish that fishermen will specialize in their catch. And the fish will be bountiful. But salt marshes remain, probably as a testimony to how the Lord changed the water from salt to fresh. And Zechariah 14 gives us a few additional interesting details about the land. Um, it says seasons will continue as they do today. So life will continue to have a rhythm like we know today. And Zechariah says the land around Jerusalem will be transformed into a large flat plain extending for miles. And we'll learn more about how this plain is used in a later episode. Finally, on top of the mountain will sit the temple and seat of government for the entire kingdom period. The nations of the world, wherever they are settled, will make their way to Jerusalem to learn from the God of Israel. And the laws of the world will come from Zion, from the word of the Lord. So the capital of the earth will be Jerusalem, where the Lord dwells in ruling the nations. And we'll study more about the Lord's dwelling place, you guessed it, in a future episode. In uh, Micah says that the Lord renders decisions between the nations, including mighty distant nations. To rule over people implies that they need ruling in order to do the right thing. That's a sign that sin is still present, and therefore the world needs Christ's perfect judgment to ensure proper behavior. But Christ, rule, Christ rules with such perfection that he can control sin even on the opposite side of the earth. Christ exerts his perfect rule through a government that does his bidding perfectly. And Isaiah says that his government officials will know his will instantly to do it always. His government will ensure that no sin gets room to grow or take peace from the earth. In fact, um, Micah says that implements of war will be done away with. And the art of war will be forgotten altogether. So while sin still exists, it will have no material impact on life since it will be under perfect rule at all times. So the Lord will break or rule them with a rod of iron, shatter the resistance of sinful nations like pottery. Um, and the psalmist in Psalm 2 um, also says there are kings and judges of the earth in that day, who Micah says should show discernment and ruling. So this means there's a government under Jesus, um, not like the corruption we have today. It's under Jesus. It's a government that rules with Jesus under his authority. It carries out his orders perfectly to ensure that sin is ruled perfectly. The government sits on his shoulders, meaning Jesus presides over bureaucracy. The world's a big place, and there are many to rule over, so Christ enlists others in his government, including us, believers. And the government is divided into a Jewish government and a Gentile government. Israel, the nation that saw so many rule over it in the past, will now rule over all the world. And their most famous king will return to rule over them as their prince, serving under the authority of um, King Jesus. 
David, resurrected, returns to rule over the land of Israel in Christ's government. He is called prince because Jesus is king. So under David, we find the 12 tribes of Israel ruled by the apostles as Jesus promised in Matthew 19. The tribes of Israel will exist in their land and have additional rulers over them. We can assume that these additional rulers will be other great Old Testament saints rewarded with positions of honor for their service. Moving to Gentiles, we find a little less detail, so we can learn a few things. First, Gentile nations are spread around the world and will have a need of government represent representation too, and you and I will feel that need. The church saints will rule over them. We saw this already in Revelation um, 20 verse 4 when we heard that the church saints will rule with Christ. Also, Jesus taught parables emphasizing that he will reward those who are faithful here and now with the opportunity to be faithful with more. In the parable um, of the in Luke 19 parable, Jesus rewarded spiritual maturity with the opportunity to rule over cities. That parable pictures the way Christ will assign us roles in the kingdom government. You may say, oh, we don't care whether you have a high position in the kingdom government, but Jesus holds it as a desirable reward. So we should aspire to please him now and in the kingdom as well. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, Finally, we need to understand that all nations are not created equal in this age. Israel will be the highest nation on earth, and all other nations will serve Israel. The Gentiles will serve Israel, and the Lord will set Israel above all other nations in honor and position. This is a complete reversal of Israel's historic position ever since the Lord began to discipline the nation for their sin. Now they receive their blessings under God's promises. It's worth a moment to remember how Israel arrived at this point in glory. They were created as a nation by God through Abraham, received promises. They entered into a national covenant to obtain God's blessing. They violated the Old Covenant, and so they spent many long years as a people under God's judgment. They were dispersed and then suffered great losses. Ultimately, they endured the tribulation where God brought them to their end. In the end, they came to faith and received their Messiah, and he will save them and bring them the promised blessings of the covenant and make them to obey God's law perfectly, and he will make them the chief nation of the earth. Now, all this need for government and ruling suggests that there will be disobedience in that time. And disobedience implies sin. So the question comes, how and why will sin exist in the kingdom? And that will be next episode of Just One Man. Thanks for listening.